Well, hi there. Uh, welcome back to part two of uh, Python programming. I'm glad you guys could, uh, could come, uh, come by today. Um, I would like to remind everybody uh, about the overall project we're trying to hit with our six-part series. We want to be able to read a FASTA file, and from that FASTA file, we want to come up with two different kinds of measurements. One would be how many sequence entries are there in this FASTA file. And the other thing is, how many times is each amino acid used in this FASTA file? So that's a pretty straightforward goal. Um, but I want to point out that the flowchart that we looked at last week, uh, last Friday, has several decision points marked by these blue uh, diamonds. And those blue diamonds reflect places where we're going to have to make a decision and go one way or the other with that uh, with the software. We call this conditional execution. Um, and the, the most common kind of way that that's handled is through something called an if statement. We also have cases where certain functions need to happen again and again. So we see down here at the lower left that we read the next protein sequence, determine if we successfully read a sequence, and if so, update our statistics, and then continue on to the next sequence. But you can see that this cycle down here is going to repeat many, many times in the course of an individual FASTA file because the FASTA contains lots and lots of sequences. So visually, on our flowchart, that looks like a loop. And in programming, in computer science, that's what we call it, a loop. So we're going to explore two different kinds of loops that are feasible within Python, the for loop and the while loop. OK, um, we have uh, a couple other things that we need to talk about as well, and those are functions and methods. Now, on, on Friday, I realized that when I uh, it, when I talked about functions and methods, I did so rather abruptly and, and didn't really give us time to think about them. So um, today we're going to try to go into some of the, the concepts that lead uh, to these, these kinds of constructs. Okay, so I'm going to pop out of the slides from last week, come back to this week, and open up our first slide. Great. Um, so we're going to start with trying to differentiate functions and methods. Both of these represent cases where we have a bunch of lines of code that we want to execute multiple times, and we want to use them with different inputs. So for that, having the ability to define a block of code as a function that can be applied on arbitrary input really matters. Most of the time when you're looking at, at source code, you can tell what, that you're looking at a function or method because it has these parentheses on it. Some, some uh, function calls that we make are given no additional input. So you might see um, a call to a function with parentheses with nothing between the parentheses. That's an indication that you're not giving any additional information. Um, but in, in many cases, we find that functions require additional data to do whatever they're going to do. We shove that between the parentheses. Um, functions and methods both typically return uh, some sort of value to the user. Uh, that's not universally the case, but it's often the case. So that return value is another thing that characterizes functions and methods. In Python, there's this, uh, this clear expectation that parameters will be passed explicitly. Um, we'll look at some examples of that again as we pass some coordinates into a function we're going to do. Um, but functions are rather different from methods in that methods belong to something called a class. A class is a really important thing if you're doing object-oriented programming in particular. So for our example, we're going to look at the class string that has quite a few methods associated with it. So let's start with uh, our example of a function. I, I find that in bioinformatics, we very frequently need to decide how similar two things are. And one of the, the common measures that's used for this is called the Euclidean distance. So here we have the example code for implementing a Euclidean distance. Now, uh, imagine that you have an xy plane, and you have a couple points somewhere on that plane. How do you decide how close they are? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. We have two points. We're going to draw a line between them. We want to know how long that line is. So, does everyone remember the Pythagorean theorem? Yeah. Ah, great, great. Okay, so, right in this case we're going to pass in the coordinates of each point separately. So we can see that x1 is going to represent where on the x-axis the first point is, y1 is going to represent where on the y-axis it is, and then we're going to have the same coordinates for a second point. 
So to make the Pythagorean theorem work, we need to figure out how long are the two sides that are next to this uh, right angle, right? You, you can remember that the Pythagorean theorem says that a squared, the, the length of one of the sides close to the right angle, and the uh, uh, and b squared, the square of the length of the other side of the triangle together are equal to c squared, the length of the hypotenuse squared. Okay, so we're going to compute how much difference exists between those two points on the x-axis, how much difference exists between those two points on the y-axis, and then return the square root of the sum of their two squares. You see this, this is x diff times x diff, here's y diff times y diff. And I think we all remember from math class, our order of operations says that multiplications happen before additions. Yeah, yeah all right, that's, a, that's an important thing to keep in mind. But we've got all this business about math dot square root. So I wanna, I wanna draw some attention to this. Now last week when we were trying to read command line arguments, we had to import something called sys, S-Y-S, um, to use its functions. Here, we're going to use the square root function from math. That's not just built into the language. It's something where we actually have to import math, the math library, so that we can make use of this function. Now, I, I, I've called it a function. That's already an error. This is actually a method, because you can see that math dot square root is how we call it. Math is the class to which it belongs. Square root is a method that's part of math. So although I'm trying to define functions, this whole um, define function Euclidean blah, 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 Inside it, I've already used a method, so I, I, I hope you'll pardon me for that. So here we have the example that we have parameters that we are feeding to, to this function, and we have a return value that is the square root of a squared plus b squared, essentially. Great. So I want to point out that when we run uh, this code, nothing happens. The software now knows what Euclidean means when we use it. We've defined a function. But the software is not reporting anything or doing anything because we haven't actually used the function. So below, I've got two calls to the Euclidean function that illustrate that we can feed it different inputs. So in this first call, Euclidean 2256 is saying that the first point we want to compute a distance for is at uh, 2 and 2 on x and y axes. And the other one is at 5 and 6 on the, y, on, on the x and y axes. So the software is going to compute that 5 minus 2 is 3, 6 minus 2 is 4, and from that it's going to get a, a distance between those two points of what? The hypotenuse. The hypotenuse for a right triangle with sides 3 and 4. 5, very nice, yes. Yeah, there's a small number of right triangles that have sides that are integers. So a, a, a triangle, a right triangle with sides three and four has a hypotenuse of five. Great. And we can run that again on this next pair. Now the first uh, point that we're doing this estimation for is still at two, two. But we're changing where the second point is to seven on the x-axis and 14 on the y-axis. Um, and we can uh, run that example. So I will, um, I think I'll just go ahead and break out of the slides here and we'll, we'll execute this function. Now, I, I have a little text editor open here in the background. Uh, you can see that it is, uh, it's pretty printing. It's, it's putting uh, different aspects of this code into color for us, and that's very nice, but I actually want to execute this code. So for this, I need to launch the interpreter. If I say Python like that and open, I see that I have the interactive mode of Python running. So I could, on the command line, tell it to run this entire script, and that would be fine. But here I'm going to do it bit by bit, so we're going to uh, do just parts of the script at any one time. So let's now grab the code for just this first example. I'm going to copy that to the clipboard, come down here, and paste it in. So you can see that when I typed import math as the first line, it immediately said done. What's next? I then said define Euclidean, and instead of giving me the three chevrons again, it gave me this dot dot dot, meaning it's waiting for what comes next. Um, so yeah, go ahead, go ahead and open up the source code, which is this uh, loop conditional func methods .py file. Uh, go ahead and open that in a text editor, and then you can just copy it uh, directly over. 
Okay, so you can see then that after defining the Euclidean, after doing all these things in return, we see that the, the code has, uh, it, it stops giving us these dot, dot, dots and comes back to three chevrons saying, okay, I'm ready for what follows that. Now, these lines get executed immediately because we don't, it's not waiting for the end of the function here. It knows that this is um, a, a, a line that can be run independently. So it prints the Euclidean distance one and this str is another example of a function that we're going to run. It's going to make the string version of the return from Euclidean. So remember we said when we pass it 2256, it gives it uh, x diff and y diff of 3 and 4, back pops the number 5. But that 5 is not a string. 5 is a number. And to Python, a number and a string are different things. So string, uh, this str function call right here, is required for us to turn that number into a bunch of characters. And you can see that it prints Euclidean distance 1 equals 5.0. I want to point out, though, that this is uh, actually doing something a little odd here. We gave it an integer of a difference of 3 and an integer difference of 4. And it, what came back was also an integer, but it's presenting it as a, as a floating point number. Yeah, 5.0. So any time you compute a square root using the math function, the return is not an integer. It's always going to be a floating point, even if it happens to round to the same value. All right, in the second case, we passed it a different set of, of x and y coordinates. 7 minus 2 is 5. 14 minus 2 is 12. So we have uh, the short side of our right triangle is 5. The long side of it is 12, which makes the hypotenuse <laughs> well, the answer is right there. <laughs> 13. <laughs> so 5, 12, and 13 is another one of these integer-sided right triangles. Okay, so that's our first example. This is a function call that makes use of a couple methods along the way. Okay, let's uh, come back into the slides here. I'm going to move on to a method example. Now, in the case of methods, um, we are looking at a function that belongs to an object. And as I mentioned, strings within Python are treated as classes. So test string one is constructed here by giving it this string of characters. This is uh, a, a really bad example of Latin that people use for uh, typesetting demonstrations. So here we have lorem ipsum dolor sit anet. And test string two is quis nostrut exercitation. Great. Wonderful. Obviously, the text can be absolutely anything you want. Now, in this case, we're going to make use of the fact that the string is a class by calling its find function. Find, uh, sorry, the, the find method belongs to this class, and its goal is pretty simple. Try to find where this text appears in a longer string. So, if you had a um, a very highly conserved sequence, and you had a protein sequence and wanted to know, does it or does it not contain this, this uh, query, find would give you that answer. But find is not sorry, going to just give us a, a yes or no answer, present or absent. I'm making the point, it's actually not Boolean in this case. It, it, it's going to try to tell us where within the string this is located. And that means that we have to sometimes account for the fact that find may not give us back an actual location, because sometimes the substring is not present. So we see that ipsum is present in test string 1, but ipsum does not appear in test string 2. And for that, I just note that when, when find returns the value negative 1, that's its way of telling you not present. OK, so again, I can click over to this grab the code for our next example. There we go. Copy that and now paste it over here. And we see that when we ran on test string one, we did a search for ipsum and it found its return value was six. Six. So let's let's look at this string again. You might you might be tempted to say one two, three, four, five, six, but
but there's no ipsum at six. It's at the seventh letter here, which is a which brings up the really important uh, proper property that many computer scientists start counting not at one but at zero. So the first position of a string in Python is not one; it's zero. So we should say zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. That's where it is. So we we have to keep that offset in mind that it's always going to treat the first character as zero. Now in the second case, when we ran against uh, our second string, quis nostra, blah, 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 we went looking for ipsum, it was not present, and so the software returned a negative one value. Okay, so all making sense so far? Yes, but so what do you think about uh, false, true false? Yes. Because like this string is now missing in the first, I mean, the, the pattern we're looking for is missing in the first, uh, okay, in the second. Uh, in the second, the second string misses it, yes. The second string, so, because I've never seen this before. What I always see is yes, no, or true, false. Ah, yes. it, well, if it's a presence or absence thing, an answer like true or false is is best. Um, so you can you can do Boolean variables in Python as well. Um, so an example of that would be, uh, I'll, I'll create one called bigger than. Bigger than equals five greater than four. You see that? So I'm not defining its value explicitly. I'm asking it to do that test, and it will return a result. So what is the value of bigger than? True. So the software is performing the test for me and returning a Boolean value. In this case, the find function is not merely saying, is it present or not, but rather, where is it? Or where is the first instance? You might consider what would be the case if we were to do something like test string three. Okay, I'm going to make this one ipsum something ipsum something ipsum. All right, now we know that ipsum is present three times in that string, but what happens if I say test string three find ipsum? Its answer is zero. So it's saying zero because the first character of test string three is the first letter of ipsum. But the fact that ipsum also appears two more times in that string's string was not returned. It, it only gives you the first location where you can find ipsum. So sometimes you also want to look for a pattern in. Yes. That's only for a true false. Yeah. Ipsum in, Lauren, Opsum, Lauren, Seek, Amit. So you can get over true or false here. Yeah. yeah. That's a Boolean kind of outcome. Right? There, there are some really good, uh, yeah, it is a Boolean outcome, yes. Um, you, you could look at um, something like. Uh, uh, a finite state machine. There's something called a dictionary tree or a hokarasic tree that's very good for creating a whole list of words you want to look for in a block of text and then you can screen that text just once and find all the different words in every place they appear. Um, but that's, that's a much more advanced application than this. Okay, I'm going to move us ahead. Um, let's talk about conditionals for a minute. I'm, I'm going to start with a really basic example if you don't mind. So I'm going to just say number equals three, if number greater than two, colon, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, that's right, uh, colon, uh, print, yes. Ha, I messed up something here. <laughs> I forgot to indent. Indentation matters all, it, it matters incredibly in Python. So now I'm, I'm indenting my second line. If number is greater than two, then I want it to print yes. And it says yes. Okay, so uh, the, the simplest example of an if statement then has a condition, in this case, number greater than two. The colon signifies that the next section should be indented. Here I've indented and said print yes. So what happens if number is not greater than two? In this case, absolutely nothing. It just continues on. Okay, so a very simple example uh, is number equals three. If number is greater than zero, then print positive. Now I've gone on with an additional, an additional possibility. In this case, we have a mutual ex mutually exclusive code paths. This is what's going to happen if number is greater than zero. 
But if that is not true, it's going to do this other option instead. That's what else does. Okay, so if number is greater than zero, it is, yes. So we print positive and we ignore everything that follows the else because the else doesn't apply. If, on the other hand, the number is not greater than zero, then it would fall to print this. And there are two ways that could happen. If I gave it the number zero, zero is not greater than zero, therefore it would do the else condition. If the number were um, negative, if I'd given the, the number negative three, it would not have printed positive, but it would say negative or zero. So we can split this out to more than, we, we already talked about one possibility where unless, if the if is met, then it will do the thing. Here we've talked about two possibilities where we have the how, what to do if the condition is met and what to do if the condition is not met. In this case, we actually have three outcomes. So here we start by asking, is the number positive? If it is, print positive and all the other stuff doesn't matter. But I've got this special elif in here. See that? Yes. This is the same thing as else if. Yeah. So this, this test will only be tested if this one has failed because it's an else if. So if the number is greater than zero, print positive and you're done. If it's not greater than zero, then we check, is it less than zero? If so, we can print negative. But there's still one more possibility. It, the number may be neither positive nor negative, in which case we need to have this last condition, else print zero. Now, it is, it's certainly the case that you can make any number of these structures. What if you wanted the software to do one thing if the number were zero or less, another if it were the number one or two, and another thing if it were three or four or five, and then another thing if it were six, seven, and eight. You can do all of those. Um, it's just you'll, you'll end up packing on an, an even taller stack of these elifs. Okay, so I, I shouldn't call it elif. It's probably bad mispronunciation. Think of it as else if. Elif. Okay. Um, so I wanted to ask you what numbers would cause the simple example to give a different output than the later example. Very small values, yes, right. So if, if you give it the number zero, you can see that the top one is going to print negative or zero, whereas the bottom one will just print zero. And if you give it a negative number, the top one will say negative or zero, and the, the bottom one will say negative instead. Okay, so that's an example where adding complexity has, has also led to a greater number of outcomes at the bottom. Okay, uh, so I have a bit of code on this one, I think. Oh, yes, this is, uh, this is the, the code itself. When you do this thing on the screen, let's say you have a minor seed sequence, but when you record, let's say, some maybe pattern in the minor seed. Yeah, yeah. So you can say if, if ATG, for example. Uh, so if you're looking at a, uh, an mRNA sequence, example, and you're, you're trying to find the presence of uh, you want to test a set of three characters whether they are or are not a start code on. Yeah, so is this equal to AUG or not? Okay, so you say if, I don't know what's is equal to ATG, this is present, like something like that. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, you could do that. Uh, you could say, uh, you could use the find statement, for example, from our, uh, from our previous example, to say, given this messenger RNA, is there any example of AUG anywhere in the sequence? That's easily done. Uh, that would look something like mRNA equals uh... okay, now I have no idea whether I typed an AUG in there or not. I think I did not. I'll, I'll, throw, in, uh, I'll throw in one here at the end. Okay, so now I have messenger RNA um, if uh, mRNA find parentheses AUG and paren colon print ooh, yes it does 
Now if I change the sequence up here to not have those last three letters and repeat that code. Oh, there is one. Where did I throw it? <laughs> well, I don't see it. <laughs> thing you're saying is. Yep. It says there's an AUG there somewhere. Backwards. Yeah, I see it backward there. Well, in any case, yes, that's, that's how it should behave itself. Okay. So, yes, th there's no reason that you have to have numeric conditions uh, for that. But, in fact, that one does evaluate to a number because a number is returned from find. Okay. Uh, great. So, we have the examples here of the code that we used up above. I'm not really going to walk through that example because I think it's kind of... <laughs> it's a little bit, it's a little straightforward. Yeah. Right, so if I just grab this code and say number equals three, and then I execute that bottom test, it reports it's positive. If I say number equals zero and rerun that code, it says zero. And if I say number equals minus three, it says negative. Okay, so all pretty straightforward. How's that first lesson in programming going? You had no idea it was this tedious, huh? Uh, all right. Well, I, this is it, it's good that everybody's learning because yeah, I, it's much easier. You know, learning every day. And this is one of the lessons I'm appreciating. Yeah, thank you. Good. I um, I, I have to say, I've been teaching myself Python to to teach the the course. So um, my my. My experience is largely in Java or C Sharp or Pascal or Basic, mm -hmm. um, but Python is actually quite new to me. So, ah, that's awesome! <laughs> awesome, that's what I like to hear. Okay, this brings us to looping. Looping is really, really valuable. We already mentioned that we had an example of a loop in our flowchart for how the software should run. So, we're going to look at two different kinds of loops. One is the for loop which is what you need when you have a certain number of times that you want to run your code. And then we're going to look at a while loop, which gives you the ability to set a condition for continuance. All right, so I'm going to start with a special uh, data structure that Python uses called a list. You can see that here I've specified that colors is equal to this list. Now, you'll note that previously when I was setting up values for strings, I would generally just say, you know, the name equals double quote, some series of strings, etc. But in this case, I've got a square bracket here. And that indicates to Python that what follows us is not just a string. It's a list of strings, a collection of them. Now, it's, it's possible that I would do a, uh, do a list of, of something other than that. Like I might say primes equals square bracket 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. See that? And now when I say primes, it keeps all of those values. So you're not limited to having just one value for a particular variable. In this case, colors is set to be equal to red, orange, yellow, green. You can go on to any number you like, really. But you can see that in this next case, I'm going to use the fact that colors has multiple colors within it, a list of colors, by using a for loop, setting this color to be each different member within colors. So the first time this code runs, this color will be red. The second time through, this color will be orange. Third time, this color will be yellow. And the fourth time, this color will be green. So in the code that executes within the loop, I've told it I want to print the string itself that has been pulled from colors, so red in the first case. I want to add a space to the end of that. There's one space in between those double quotes. And then I want it to run two functions, one inside the other. So red is what it's going to be on the, uh, what this color is going to represent on the first pass. Len is going to, to compute the length of that string. So the length of it is one, two, three characters. That evaluates to just three. And then we're going to convert that number back to a string so we can print it to, to the screen. If I open the interpreter again and come to my example in the code, I'm going to use this for loop 
and copy just that section over here. There we go, that's the output. So remember that we separated the string itself, red, orange, or yellow, by a space from the number of, 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 of characters in the string. So I, one of the things I didn't realize as I was typing this example is that orange has the same number of letters as yellow. Wow. How has my life changed? Amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For the better now. I'll, always for the better, absolutely. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a kind of odd behavior that comes right back to this thing that computer scientists start counting with zero. Here we're going to look at the first 10. Oh, sorry, let me move back up here. We're going to look back at this, uh, at an exercise I'm calling first 10. In this case, I'm using the range function to create a range class that contains the first 10 numbers. This number is going to be each of those numbers in succession, and each time we're just going to print it. But the result is going to be a little different than you might assume if you're used to counting the way that we are taught in school. So let's grab this code and run this in our interpreter in the background. There we go. Well, we see that the numbers, the first number printed is zero. It's not just strings that start at zero. The range function is also going to return ranges that start at zero. So we told it we want the first 10 numbers and the software responded with zero through nine. Zero through nine. So this, uh, we when we give it uh, the specification that we want 10 numbers, it gives us 10 numbers, but they start at zero, not one. Okay, you can also do some other cool tricks with range. So I, here I've used three parameters for it. You can look in the help files for all of these functions to see what they return. But in this case, I've told it that the first number I want is four. The last number I'm willing to look at is 20, and I want to take it in steps of two. Now you might think, I've told it the last number I want is 20. Surely that means that 20 is one of those numbers that we're going to run this on. But it's sneaky, is Python. So when I run this code, I see that four is the first number, sure enough. Six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, no 20, no 20. So in, in, the, in this code, that last number is treated as a, a first not okay number, not the last number inclusive, it's the last number exclusively. Okay, so range can be a little tricky, um, but we, we always have to remember to, to look out for that, otherwise we end up with weird behavior in our, in our software. Okay, but in all of these cases, we're doing something called iteration, which means running the same code on, the, the, on, on different values. Um, and this iteration, this repeating of the code, is going to happen for some pre-specified number of times. That's quite different than what we get in a while loop. In a while loop, our iteration continues until some condition is no longer true. So x is the condition that we're going to provide. Now, one of the most common things that we do in bioinformatics um, is touch biostatistics, of course. So I wanted you to imagine that we are computing p-values, okay? Imagine that you're running t-test. Ordinarily, you would use t-test to say, are the means of these two cohorts different or not? Um, now, from, from a biostatistical perspective, the p-value that comes back for a t-test is saying, how likely is a result this extreme to have occurred by random chance? which can feel, feel a little weird, but I would just say that if you have random numbers, truly random numbers, and you run a t-test, do you expect to get a small p-value? Okay, that, that's a good answer. That's a good answer, actually. If you have just a bunch of random noise, no difference between cohorts at all, it's still possible for t-test to produce a low p-value. So in the, the, the most common test that we use is to say, well, if the p-value is less than 0.05, then it's a significant difference. But what I want to convince you today is that if you run enough tests, you will get significant hits even when there's no difference whatsoever. 
So it, when, when you have no real difference between the two cohorts, you should get p-values that are uniformly distributed, anywhere from 0 to 1. Okay, so in this test, we're going to count hits, which is to say, how many times have we produced a p-value that's less than 0.05? And we're going to keep track of how many tries we had to do in order to achieve that result. The software continues until it has produced five hits. Count, the count of hits starts at zero. So it will only go up if this random number is less than 0.05. Oh, I should note, uh, once it, you remember before we imported math because we were going to use the square root function. Here we're going to import random because we're going to use the random function from it to generate a bunch of random numbers. Okay, so um, we're going to start count of hits at zero and count of tries at zero. And while count of hits remains less than five, we're going to increase count of tries. Do you see this little plus equals thing? Ah, so many people might be familiar with languages like C or C++. I don't know if you guys have ever worked with those. Did you know that the name C++ is a joke? It's a math joke. Is it? It is. Programmers can never resist math jokes. Okay, so in the, lang in the language C, if you have a variable called C, that has a value of, say, 5, and you want to add 1 to it, you simply say C++, which is the same thing as C equals C plus 1. So it would look up the value of C, come up with 5, add 1 to it, get 6, and store that back in C. But the very, the very abrupt way of saying that is just C++. That's different here in Python. Here, when we want to increase the value of a counter, we use plus equals one. In C, this would read count of tries plus plus. In, in this case, we say plus equals one. Oh, I forgot the punchline. The punchline, why is C++ the name of the programming language a joke, is that the inventors of C++ were trying to say, we're one better than C. <laughs> C++ is a great language, don't get me wrong. All right, but we don't get to use count of tries plus plus here. Instead, we must say count of tries plus equals one. We will then compute a random number. Now, when you use random random like this, the value that comes back is somewhere between zero and one. It's not normally distributed, though it's uniformly distributed. So, um, you know, imagine that you have a 20-sided die. Does anyone here ever play Dungeons and Dragons? Some, sometime in your life, perhaps? Yeah. Well, I guess. Okay, well, one of the things that you do when you're playing tabletop Dungeons and Dragons is that you roll your d20. And the rolling a 20-sided die has an equal probability of any number from 1 to 20. In the same way, when we run random random, we are getting a random number that's anywhere between 0 and 1. Yeah. It doesn't have a special preference for, for 0.5. Okay. okay, so in this case, having generated a random number, we ask, is it less than 0.05? If so, then we're going to add to our hits. Now remember, we already added to tries up here. We don't have to do, we don't want to do that inside the if because we always want count of tries to go up. The count of hits only goes up if we have a, a hit. And we will also print the number that we got from the random number generator. Then when all of that is finished, we print, we generated this many attempts. Okay? All right, now I'm going to ask a question to see how closely you're, 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 you're following the math here. <laughs> okay. How many times, on average, should we have to generate a random number between 0 and 1, uniformly distributed, to get one that has a value of less than 0.05? Is it a thousand times? Nope, it's not a thousand times. Is it five? It is not five times. Okay. Um, okay. Is it like let me ask this a different way. <laughs> if I roll a 20-sided die, and I'm, I'm going to keep rolling until I hit the number 1, we call it a glitch <laughs> in D&D, &D. How, many, how many times do I need to roll the die by random chance before I expect to have gotten a 1 once? 20 times. 20 times. Yes. Right. Yep. Because, because it's a 20-sided die. Because it's a 20-sided die, exactly. In the same way, if you think about it, 
0 0.05 is the reciprocal of what number? <laughs> and the reciprocal, what, where do you come from? <laughs> <laughs> it, okay, it's 5%. But what is what? What's the relationship of five percent to one? What's that? Uh, no, no. Okay. What? <laughs> okay. Let me let me ask it a different way. We'll 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 toss out reciprocal for a minute. How many times does 0 0.05 go into one? If you just divide one into the other. Twenty times. Yes. So all that nonsense about twenty-sided die actually had irrelevance here. You have you you would expect that every twenty times that you generate this random number between zero and one, it will be below 0 0.05. There you go. Okay. So if this code runs just as it is here, we expect that it takes about a hundred runs of this code, a hundred loops through this while section before five random numbers below 0.05 have been generated, because it happens one every 20 times on average. OK, so let's see if this holds up to scrutiny. I am going to open the code up here and run our while loop. Do, 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 do. Copy that to the clipboard and paste. Oh, I've got an error. I have an indentation error that's terrible. Well, this runs in the script. <laughs> How weird. Well, okay. I, I tell you what, I'll, I'll run this one on the command line properly so that uh, we, we see how this runs. Okay, I'm going to go to the Sun Python class. There we go. Now I need to get the Python executable, which is hidden in a really obscure place. All right, Python. Okay, open the file location. This is such a misery. Okay. And open, the, open the true file location. There we go. All right, I'm now going to drag Python exe over here and 201905, that one. There we go, down at the bottom of the code. So it, it doesn't like my indentation very much when I do it that way, but OK. So having, having run this code, I see that these five values were all below 0.05. Now, I'm going to ask you a tough question here. You ready? You've run, a, you've run a t test, and the p value that pops out is 0 0.00387. Are you happy? You are happy. You get to publish, you get to graduate, it's all wonderful. These numbers are random, and they're just as low as that. So we should always keep in mind that it is certainly possible to generate very low numbers by chance alone. In, the, in this case, I generated six, 67 random numbers to get five that were below 0 0.05. So does this, how is it? Because now you have a clinical trial, for example, you want to get a significant, you want to look at, it, you want to look at a, a drug efficacy, for example. Mm -hmm. Because now you're talking about the, these numbers are random chance and random numbers. Yeah. And how do you take that into consideration when making a decision? Ah, well, I'm, 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 my favorite topic actually is multiple testing correction. Multiple testing correction is how we deal with the fact that we may randomly produce very small p-values. So in my second test of the code, the first time I think it was 67 uh, tries to get five significant hits. This time I generated 75 numbers before I got five hits. I'm going to run it again. 55 tests to get five random hits. 115. 48. 127. 74. You can see it's changing around each time because these are random. But if you look at this time, you just generate lots of these runs and then average the amount of average chance that you have for. Uh, oh, how, how do I know that average is 100? Yeah. By theory. Okay. Uh, because we know that um, a, a, a truly random number drawn between the values 0 and 1 will fall in the 0.05 range 1 20th, 1 20th of the times. So if I did an infinite number of runs, infinity divided by 20 is how many uh, p-values below 0.05 I should get. Yeah. So the number bounces around quite a lot. So how does this, how does this bear on the statistics we use for proteomics? 
In proteomics, we are typically computing p-values for maybe a thousand proteins at a time. How many of the thousand proteins should show a p-value below 0.05 by random chance alone? One in 20. It's like rolling a 20-sided die for each protein. Yeah. So for that, we, we always try to make use of multiple uh, correction, uh, multiple test correction. That can be Bonferroni if we're being uh, trying to protect ourselves against making any uh, false positives. Or we would use something called Benjamini Hochberg, which would help us to control the rate of false positives instead. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's the example. Um, we've now walked through uh, methods and functions. We've talked about conditional execution with if, if, uh, sorry, if, elif, and else. <laughs> I always find that hard to say. We, we've talked about um, for loops where we try to run a section of code once for each item in a set or each number in a set. And we've talked about while loops where we run until some condition has been met. Those, those features show up in almost every programming language out there. So even if you never use Python again, those concepts are something you should be aware of even if you decide to go to the fine world of Java or C Sharp or C++. These concepts will, will stay with you in all of those places. Great. Well, thank you very much for sitting in today. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome, Jenny. <laughs>